Let me read to you a passage from the 8th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. This is 18 to 22. It's the Gospel for Monday of the 13th week of ordinary time. St. Matthew writes, When Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other shore. A scribe approached and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But Jesus answered him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. That's from Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 to 22. We are led to think of Christ above all. Consider Buddha. Consider Confucius. Consider any great figure of history. And I suspect it will be difficult finding a personality who asked for such a total following of his own person as Jesus of Nazareth asked of his disciples. Moreover, he commissioned his disciples to go out to the whole world and make disciples of all the nations. So he set forth a scheme in which the entire world would be asked to give to his own person its total adherence. That is not in any way to say that he succeeded in eliciting this following from all those he personally invited. One need only think of Judas Iscariot and countless others who have refused him or who, having once started, subsequently fell away. Nevertheless, that is what Jesus Christ called for and what he stated as being the plan of God for man. God's plan for man is that the salvation of every man is to be found in a personal love for Jesus, ensuring, ensuing, resulting in the total acceptance of his word. Christ expects of his disciples that obedience of faith which would be given to God, and he asks that all the nations be his disciples precisely in this sense. Furthermore, he made it clear that at the end he would come to judge the living and the dead, and that all the nations would be judged by him. In that last judgment, one critical issue will be how we have treated others. But observe how, at that very judgment, he will say to those on his right hand, I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. His person is still the object of our life and of our judgment, for in serving the least who are in need, we serve the person of our Lord, and for this we shall be rewarded. Would any prudent and good man make such claims and expect such a unique personal following, unless because of his incomparable greatness it was due to him? Hardly. Christ is either all holy and to be accepted, or an impostor to be rejected. If we accept Christ as a great and holy man, then we must take seriously his claims. If his claims are false, then he is false. His call stands that we follow him with all our heart. It is this call which we see him issuing in the gospel I've just read. It is one of many similar passages which could be cited. In our gospel passage today, the scene is that of our Lord about to cross to the other shore. We read, a scribe approached him and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Matthew chapter 8, verse 18 to 22. This sentence reminds us, incidentally, that not all of the scribes were in opposition to him. There were those who were captivated by his person and his teaching and who counted themselves among his disciples. We have here a scribe who wanted to follow him wherever he chose to go. Perhaps the scribe was even stating that he wanted there and then to accompany our Lord to the other shore. Our Lord by no means refused his request to follow him physically, as he did, say, the man from the Gerasenes, whom he had exorcised, 
but he warned him of what it would entail. We are reminded by his reply to the scribes that, whatever be the discomfort, the following of Christ is the one thing necessary. The second disciple is one whom our Lord obviously took the initiative to call. Our Lord called various persons to follow him. He called Levi, and Levi immediately got up and followed him. He called the rich young man, and the rich young man went away sad because he had many possessions. He calls this disciple to follow him, but the disciple asks our Lord to give him time. He wants to go home and fix things up first by burying his father. Again, our Lord's reply to him reminds us that the following of the Master is the one thing necessary, and in all that we do, including the fulfilling of family obligations, the one thing necessary is that we be following Jesus. Our Lord allows for no distractions from this fundamental project of human life. This is of immense importance for the lay Christian to understand, because on him depends the implanting of the Christian message in the midst of the world. In the world he is to bear witness to Jesus and his word with all his heart. Let us place ourselves in the presence of Jesus in our gospel scene today, presenting before him our tendency to forget what the following of him will require, together with our tendency to turn away from him to deal with other so-called more pressing matters of life. Let us hear again his reply, telling us that there will be a cost and we must be prepared to pay it. Nothing must distract us from the one thing necessary, which is to love him with all our heart and to keep his commandments. <laughs>